I'm going to talk about delay related activity in mammal cell prefrontal cortex, something we've been doing in my lab for the past few years. We actually started to work with mammal sets about seven or eight years ago. So my background is really in macaque electrophysiology, but now we've transitioned completely to mammal sets. And hopefully I can convince you that this is actually a useful model. So this is uh, what we've heard mainly so far at this meeting. And we just had a fantastic talk about mice, the amazing things you can actually do in mice, things you could never do in a macaque, at least not right now, we can, can never get that many animals. On the other hand, macaque is obviously a great model for behavior, right? because you can train macaques on amazingly, on amazingly complex task, very similar to the task, task you can actually do on humans, obviously not language, but very complex cognitive tasks. The brain organization is very similar, they have a granular prefrontal cortex, so really they are the ideal model, but they have disadvantages, right? So they are extremely expensive. Right now, I don't know how it's here, but in Ontario or in Canada, we cannot get rhesus monkeys are impossible to get. We could get some cyanos, but even they are extremely difficult to get and really expensive now. Even if you could get them, housing macaques is expensive, handling macaques is difficult, right? They can carry B virus, so you have biosafety risks. And yeah, handling of them is difficult. Breeding macaques is difficult, takes a long time. And this is why several labs have started to work with these little guys, the marmoset monkeys. So they've become extremely popular, I would say, especially in North America. So they're now, I think we have at least 30 more labs now working with marmosets. It might be actually a lot more now. So marmosets separated from old world monkeys about like 35 million years ago. Some papers say 40 million years ago, which is still a lot less than the about 100 million years ago where rodents separated from primates. Um, they have some advantages. One advantage is that their entire cortex is smooth, which is great if you want to implant electrode arrays, if you want to do nonlinear recordings, if you want to do, for example, two photon imaging. At least it should be good. So not much has been shown actually, but. It should be ideal for that. Um, the other thing is they're small, okay? So marmos that really can fit in your hand, which makes them easy to handle, a lot easier to handle than a macaque. It's relatively easy to actually breed marmosets. So we've been breeding marmosets in our facility now for the past, I would say like six years or so, and we already had like 80 animals born in our facility, okay? Um, um, they're also, in many ways, a good model if you're interested in like social cognition because they show pro-social behavior. So the parents take care of the young, the siblings take care of the young, so the dad is actually takes care of the babies. So very similar, they're, um, they're highly vocal species. So they're also a great model if you're interested in vocalization or precursors for language. Um, Really, I think this is what really started, really, this big interest in marmosets. I think it was 2000, I think, nine, eight or nine, when um, Erika Sasaki published this paper in Nature where they created the first transgenic marmosets, and Nature called them biomedical supermodel. But marmosets actually have been used for quite a while in new science. So this is a paper from 1909 from Mott, who did electrical stimulation here in the frontal cortex of marmosets. And in particular, you showed there are a lot of areas where you could evoke eye movements and head movements in the marmoset. So they've been around for quite a while. Um, I said they are a great model for vocalizations. So a number of labs are using them for that. Great model for social behavior. There's a fair amount of studies that have used them for vision. But the question is, are they also a good model for the prefrontal cortex? So this is something uh, we looked at or started to look at. When you look at... Um, this is from Angela Roberts, uh, one of her recent review papers. It looks, when you just look at this, that they have a very similar organization, right? So first of all, it's all granular prefrontal cortex here. So lateral prefrontal cortex, granular. Same thing in the marmoset as it's in the macaque and the human. And you get pretty much the same areas here, right? So 8AV, 8AD, there's a 46. Some papers uh, separate them separate it into 46V and D. 47, 10, 45, so looks always similar. But there are obviously differences, right? So the marmoset has a small brain, so it's an advantage, but it's probably also a disadvantage, right? So because when you look at the 
amount of space that the prefrontal cortex occupies is really pretty small. I would say it's probably about four to five millimeters what we have prefrontal cortex in the marmoset. So a lot smaller than we have in macaque here. And there are differences. Um, you might have seen part of this figure actually already this morning, but so this has comparison with human, macaque, and marmoset, so spine density. All right, so it decreases in humans from frontal to occipital cortex. And you can already see, so it's lower in macaques, so here in gray, and here in light gray, these are marmosets. So marmosets, the density is a lot less than in macaques. And what's interesting, it's actually not the highest in frontal cortex, it's actually higher in temporal cortex than in frontal cortex. Okay, so there are differences. So we thought, okay, let's see if we can train marmosets on this like typical task that we use when we test prefrontal cortex function in, in macaque monkeys, which is a spatial working memory task. So this here is the delayed response task, schematic here from so, uh, nice review paper, old review paper from Goldman Rakish. So monkey is presented with a food choice here. Then there's a delay. Screen goes up after the delay and the animal has to make a choice. So he has to lift this one up here in order to get his reward. And then already in the 70s, I think 71 here, Fuster used this task and we called it the prefrontal cortex. And what he found was that he found cells that responded towards the cue here. And most importantly, he found cells that were active during the delay period, right? So cells that increased or decreased their activity during the delay period. So these delay-related cells. And importantly, the same cells here in this case did not respond to monkey calls. So they seem to be really specific to the delay period. Here's another 73 paper from Fuster. We showed different cell types so here, so a cell that responds to the cue, a cell that's active for the cue and for the delay period. Here a cell that ramps up during the delay period really, a cell that de goes down during the cue, this one also goes down during the cue and then comes back up, and here a cell that just shuts down completely during the task. So you almost get every combination. But the main thing is you get cells that have sustained activity, okay? And then a few years later, Patricia Goldman Rakish adopted the task. It was developed actually by um, Bob Wurz and uh, Hikosaka. They used this memory guided saccade task where you have sort of a fixation point in the center of the screen, the stimulus is presented, usually one of eight locations. Then it's the delay period where there's nothing on the screen. When the fixation point disappears, the monkey has to make a saccade towards the location where the stimulus was. Okay, and they found cells here that had Q activity, other cells had delay activity, other cells had response activity, and importantly not shown here, this was tuned. So a lot of cells had tuned activity, right? So they really liked the delay, uh, they, they had delay activity for, say, for this location, but no delay activity for this location. So there was this tuning of delay activity. So this is why this task has become extremely popular and it's still used, most labs still if they do anything where they want to separate visual activity from motor activity, they train the animals on this memory guided saccade task. It's not very difficult in a macaque. So we try to do the same thing. Our question really was, so do marmosets, PFC, and neurons have delay-related activity? And if yes, in which areas is this delay activity? And we initially tried this with this memory guided saccade task. I tried it in three monkeys for several months, probably at least like six months, and it just didn't work. I can, you can train mammal sets to fixate, you can ma ma train mammal sets to make a saccade, but you can't train them to first fixate and then make a saccade. At least we failed and we just couldn't do it. I probably would have continued doing it, but then came COVID and we had to stop running our monkeys. But we had just started developing a touchscreen system. So, we then used the touch screens because even though I was not allowed to go into the lab, our technicians could go in to take care of the animals. So they would run the animals on these touch screens. <laughs> so the touch screen system that we designed is actually attached to the cage. So the animal basically really never leaves the cage. Okay. Um, it's a modified transport box. We have a commercially available touch screen that we attach here. There's a syringe pump, so the animal gets gum, diluted gum here and the entire thing is controlled by Raspberry Pi computer. Okay, so it's a really simple system. And then we also combined this with neural recordings using, uh, using uter arrays. So we trained animals on a 
different task. I'm just going to show you here this delayed match location task, which is similar to what Fusta, for example, used. So one stimulus is presented here during the sample period. Then there's a delay. And then the animal is presented with four choices. So and all the animal has to do is has to touch the stimulus. Okay? <laughs> and there's no, the animal is freely moving, right? So we're not, they, they can look anywhere. We have a camera, so we know where they're looking. Or at least we know where, where they're orienting their head. Um, they can also, we even allow them to touch the sample stimulus. And initially they do this, after a while they actually give up doing that. Because they notice they don't get, never get a reward for that. So I have to touch this, get a reward. Okay, I'm going to show you. So this is actually fairly early on training of, this was the first monkey we ever did this. I'm going to show you a video here. There is audio, but I don't, the audio is not playing. But so whenever the animal does it correctly, he also gets, in addition to the, uh, to the reward, he's also getting a tone. So here he made a mistake. I well, can see that they're doing it, right? So, and um, we have a camera, so we can look at that. We can also see, I mean, are they better when they're just constantly looking at the stimulus? We find they can actually do both. So actually, very often they just look around, actually, during the delay period, they reorient the body. And we went up to delay epochs of up to eight seconds for this. Okay, you can see, so animals working quite well. It takes us about six to eight weeks to train the animals to do this. Okay, for, from totally the beginning. And it's all just in the cage. We can train a fair number of animals now. So here's uh, with this two second delay duration, so we can see all the animals are about like 65 up to 70%, which is a lot better than 25% chance. Still a lot worse than I think than a macaque would be on this. If we increase the delay period here, so we can see this here, it definitely drops, what you would expect, but they're still, even at eight seconds, they're well above chance. Chance is 25%. So we then combined this with recordings. So, and we want to do unrestrained recordings. So we implanted Utah arrays, and we used here a wireless, or essentially it's a data logger recording from Spike Gadgets. So we can record for like two hours from 100, new, from 100 channels at 30 kilohertz. And this is where we implanted our arrays. So two animals, pretty much the same location, one animal on purpose, we implanted more medial and more anterior. And you can see, so this is the animal that actually has this recording thing on the head. It's quite high, but they actually, they work still pretty good with that. It takes them about a week to adjust. You can see here we actually put bars in because we found that some animals actually don't touch it with their hands, they actually use their mouth. So we try, try to prevent that, so that's why we use bars here then for later versions for our touch screens. Okay, so what do we find? So, we actually find pretty much the same thing what Fusta found. So this is, a, just gonna show you a couple of example cells here. So this is a cell here that increased activity, its activity during the sample period, went down during the delay, and then came on again during the response period here. This is a cell that has essentially the opposite pattern, right? So decreased during the sample period, increased during delay, decreased during the response period, this is another cell here that has had just delay activity. This one decreases activity during the delay. This one has Q activity, sustained activity, and then response activity. This one just shuts down here. And then we found a lot of cells also that had response-related activity. All right, so here's a cell that goes up with its activity before the response, another cell that goes down. The cell is very active after the response. The cell goes down. The cell ramps up here and then has, has activity, and this one goes down. And we also found that a lot of these cells had location tuning. So this particular cell here had its maximal activity for stimuli here, um, left, top left, and uh, I guess bottom left, and really lowest activity for bottom right. So there's a tuning here. What we then did for, the, for all the cells, we looked at, do we get better tuning for correct trials compared with error trials? And that was the case. So we computed the selectivity index. So um, you can see that the numbers, so these are, each dot is one cell, so the, they have all lower selectivity here on, um, well, 
higher selectivity on correct, on correct trials, lower selectivity on error trials. So basically, when the monkey makes a mistake, we lose this differentiation between in, in this tuning. So then we did ex vivo localization of the arrays. So we perfused the animals, we removed the arrays, and then we imaged the animals overnight at 100 micrometers in our 9.4 Tesla scanner. And you can actually very nicely see the individual electrode tracts here. So we reconstructed this. And this is where we found the different cells. So we have here, I should say, so these are actually regions where we d did not get cells. This is actually the first monkey had an array that was two years old already. Okay, so at this location, we didn't get any cells anymore. But you can see here, so we have sample activity here. We have units with delay-related activity. And we have a lot of cells that have, are active during the response period. All right, so I'm plotting here the proportion of units that are active. Same with this animal here. You can see some cells that have sample activity here. You can almost see some patches, I would say. Swim here. Swim is there, yes. You can almost see some patches. That might be the case. Same thing here. So lots of delay activity here, sample activity here, and then many cells that have response-related activity. So just to summarize this, basically, yeah, so we definitely find delay-related delay activity in Marmoset's prefrontal neurons, and we find very similar cell type that Fuster already described in his, in his 71, 73 paper. I would like just very quickly because Wim actually showed, so this is basically, these are the results, okay? So just for two monkeys, monkey B and monkey A, where these clusters are. And because we had the arrays and we thought, well, just do something else, let's test them on different things. So we did visual field mapping. So you see, so where do we get tuned visual neurons, you see? So here we find all visual neurons, neurons that have any visual responses. Here we find cells with contralateral responses, so mainly here in area 8 AV. We looked at categorical images. We looked, looked at faces, objects, and scrambles. So very similar to what Wim showed you for his fMI data. And you can see here that there's a clear patch here. There are a lot of cells here in area 8 ID that responds to faces in monkey B. In monkey A here, they were raised in a different location. We find this actually in area 10. So there might be multiple patches here. We also did, so similar here, we did faces and arms and bodies. So this was done in a completely different session than this here. But you can see that you get similar tuning here for faces, here and here, even though this was, these sessions were separated by several weeks, actually. So it seemed to be pretty consistent, these patches then. We also get here, for example, a patch, I'm gonna call it patch now, that was active for arms and bodies, okay? We did auditory stimuli. We said marmosets are very, is a very vocal species. So we actually get a ton of cells that respond to auditory stimuli. And the absolute majority of the cells are then also call selective. So they differentiate between the different marmoset calls. So we get a lot of cells that are call selective. A lot of auditory cells, mainly I would say here 8AD, 4060, so more towards the medial part. We get auditory cells in the marmosets. Uh, we did purely saccad activity, saccad cells here. So we just looked at where do we get tuning for saccads. And they seem to be mainly in area 8AV here. And this monkey, this monkey here, we didn't cover 8AV. And we still get a lot of tuning here at actually very interior at the border of 64, V, and 10. Okay. And we've done a lot of other things. I'm not going to go into this. We did movies and all kinds of stuff there. We are now mapping the um, anterior cingular cortex in the mammal set. At this point, just with passive stimuli, and we're focusing actually on vocalizations because we did an fMRI study where we found here in 32 higher activity for mammal set vocalization than scrambled vocalizations. And this is a single neuron here in area 32 recorded with a new pixel probe. You can see this cell responds to a Twitter call there's more activity for Twitter than for fee and for chirp calls. And what we're also trying to do, and it's difficult, we're trying to see if we can do wireless recording with newer pixel probes. Because what we really want to do is we look at, want to take advantage of the smooth mammosa cortex and look at the microcircuitry. So what we've done is we actually implanted new pixel probes. 
but we find we can only get activity on these probes for about a week. Afterward, it is, so we can get something like 150 cells. So we, we don't get 200 cells per recording session. We get like 50 cells per recording session. But it definitely drops very fast if you implant the probes. OK, and then I'd like to finish this up. I'd like to thank the students who did this. So this is Janahan and Raymond. They did the recordings. Kevin Johnson is a scientist in my lab. And Cheryl is my technician. And very lastly, just uh, we have openings for postdocs. We do also new pixel recordings, fMRI. We're just getting a two-photo microscope. It's getting installed next month. So really getting into that. So if anybody's interested in working with marmosets, please contact me.